good morning, everyone. May I have your attention, please? I uploaded uh, some information in regard to your first coursework and your laboratory assignment. Uh, I tried to answer as many questions you may have, however, it's possible you ha still have some queries. So I discussed it further during the problem solving session on Friday, and you have any questions you can ask. The laboratory sessions start next week, and I believe you're already on your uh, laboratory timetable, personal timetable. If you have any queries, you need to contact uh, Mrs. Uh, Christine Jinx. She's in charge of the timetabling for laboratories. So before I move on to chapter uh, three, are there any questions you would like to ask? So I finished a chapter uh, two, the lecture slides and all the examples. It was a relatively short uh, chapter. Now we move on to chapter uh, three. Chapter three is a purely mathematical, but uh, we need this information for future chapters, chapters four, five, and six. Chapter three is based on cross-sectional properties of members, such as center of gravity or centroid, first moment of area, second moment of area, polar second moment of area, and also the approximation we make when we analyze a thin walled sections, typical of aircraft structures or aerospace structures. The product moment of area is also a cross-sectional property, but it's not included because the sections you analyze have at least one axis of symmetry. The product of moment of area is usually for sections which have no axis of symmetry. They're called asymmetric section. So as I said, we need this information, cross-sectional properties, for analyzing structures, members, when they are subject to bending or torsion or a combination of those. So in chapter one, if a member was subject to axial loading, subject to tension or compression, or when the section was subject to shear loading, simple shear, the stress applied to the section depend only on the area, the cross-sectional area of the section, or the area the force is applied to. So regardless of what the shape is, if we have two structures which have the same cross-sectional area, they'll be subject for the same amount of force, they're subject to the same stress, as I said, regardless of the shape they are. But when a structure is subject to bending, or when it's subject to torsion, the stress does not depend on the area anymore. Two sections could have the same area, but they could be subject to different amount of stresses, normal stress or shear stresses. So this is what we had in a chapter one. The stress, the stress applied to the section depends on the cross-sectional area. So this is a normal stress, the shear stress, the equation mathematically is the same. Tau is equal to force applied divided by the area. Now when the section is subject to bending, the stress depends on the second moment of area, which we use capital I to show it. So two sections which have the same second moment of area are subject to the same stress, regardless of their shape. Or we have a section which is subject to torque, especially for a circular section, it depends on the set polar second moment of area. So you're already familiar with area, how to calculate the area of a section. So for a rectangle, you say width divided multiplied by height. So that is a property of a section. In a very similar way, I and J are also properties of section. So this is why we are doing it. As I said, this section is purely mathematical, but as a, an engineer, aerospace engineer, you need to have good understanding how to find the 
properties or cross-sectional properties of members. So we thought, as I said, you're already familiar with area. So this is the first, yes, please. This, this one, yeah. yes, this sign, oh, that's a good, actually, I, I forgot to explain it. Now, when we want to show torsion in a two-dimensional plane, we usually use a double arrow to show it. Thank you, I forgot about it, excellent. So, we usually use a double arrow to show it. I'm going to explain it in more detail in chapter four, however, for the time being. So, the double arrow shows my thumb, the direction of the double arrow is in the direction of my thumb, and the way my fingers a curl shows the direction of the torque. So if you look at this at the moment, so this, the thumb is in the direction of the double arrows, and the way my fingers curl shows the direction of the torque. And the other side is the same. So you can see this bar or this member at the moment is twisted. So we usually torque and the force is out of plane, creates torsion. So we can show it as a three-dimensional object, but it's much easier to use double arrow and show it as a two-dimensional figure, in a two-dimensional figure. Does it answer the question? As I said, I explain it in more detail in chapter four. So we move on to a slide a number two. So first, a moment of area. That is a property of section. We use a little i to show it. Now, the formal way of explaining first moment of area is the way I show, I've shown you on a slide number three. But I start with a, an informal way of showing you what the first moment of area is, and then we move on to a slide number three is the way books explain it, textbooks. So I is the little i for the first moment of area. So you're familiar with a rectangular section, and you know where the position of its centroid is. It's exactly in the middle. So the, say this is a rectangle with the width of B and the height of H. So G is the center of gravity or centroid of the section. These two axes, which are parallel to the edges of the rectangle, pass through the centroid. By definition, they are called central axes of the section. So G is the centroid. XG and YG are called central axes of the center or local globe coordinate system of the section. So this is a local coordinate system or central axis of the section passing through the centroid and are parallel to the edges of the rectangle. Now say we've got a different coordinate system. This coordinate system is not called local anymore. It's called a global coordinate system, which is parallel to the local coordinate system, but is located at a distance. Say the coordinates of G, the centroid of the section, with respect to this global coordinate system, are X bar and Y bar, or X bar one and Y bar one. By definition, first moment of area of this section with respect to X1 axis is equal to the area multiplied by this perpendicular distance. The first moment of area of this section with respect to the vertical axis, Y1 axis, is the area multiplied by this horizontal, per perpendicular horizontal dimension. So this is the first moment of area of this section with respect to the X1 axis and with respect to the Y1 axis. It's a bit like when you say the moment of a force. The moment multiplied by the perpendicular distance of the force with respect to any point within the plane. But this is completely different. So based on this definition, it means uh, the unit of the first moment of area is third power of length, millimeter cubed or meter cubed in the SI unit system. 
And the other thing is, the first moment of your year, because of the signs of the coordinates of the centroid could be positive or negative. <laughs> so first, the unit is the third power of length, meter cubed or millimeter cubed, and the first moment of area could be positive or negative. Now I'm going to move the global coordinate system to a new, a bit closer to the center of gravity. So in a similar way, I find that the first moments of area, or first moments of area of the section with respect to the new, two new axes. So this is the centroid. I look at the coordinates with respect to the new coordinate system and find the first moments of area of the section with respect to these new two axes. Obviously, when the global coordinate system goes closer to the center of gravity, the first moments of area, or these first moments of area, get reduced. So if I go closer and closer, it means the, center, the first moments of area of any section with respect to its central axis are always equal to zero. Because when you go closer and closer, for the axis passing through the centroid, the two coordinates become zero. So we can conclude that the first moments of area of any section with respect to its local coordinate system or the central axis are always equal to zero. So that is the characteristic of the first moment or first moments of area for this section. So that is an informal way of defi defining a first moment of area. If you have no questions, I move on to slide number three. So slide number three, as I said, is the formal way of defining first moments of area, and this is how they define it in majority of textbooks. Say we've got the cross-section of a member which is, does not have a regular shape. As you can see, it's irregular. So say G is the center of gravity or centroid of this bar with this cross-section. So X, G, Y, G are called central axes. They pass through G. Now, little x, little y, the coordinate system, the global coordinate system, X, Y, is located at the distance from the center of gravity. So the centroid of the section have the coordinates of X bar and Y bar with respect to this global coordinate system. So based on the definition we had, it doesn't matter if the section is rectangular, circular, or irregular. If we have A, if we have these two coordinates, we should be able to find the first moment of area of this section with respect to any axis. So I can say Ix, or the first moment of area of the section with respect to x, is equal to y bar multiplied by a, with respect to y is equal to x bar multiplied by a. So I start with Ix. That's the definition of first moment of area. Now I'm going to choose a tiny element on the section of this section. So it's a very small element on the cross-section. Now this tiny element also has the first moment of area. So I can say the first moment of area of this small element with the area of dA, differential of A, is equal to its coordinate y multiplied by A. So I can say the first moment of area of this tiny element is y dA. Now say I divide this section to several elements similar to what you see on the board. The, I discretize it to loads of elements. And if I add up all the first moments of area of all those little elements and add them up, or mathematically, if I integrate this term over the cross-section, I can say this is the first moment of area if I know where y bar is, 
This is when I don't know where my bar is, so I can use this integral to find the second moment of view of the section. Now, this integral is a double integral because we can say dA is equal to dx multiplied by dy. Now, in mathematics, if I say dA, I just use one integral sign to show it. But if I write it as dx dy, then I use two integral signs to show it. So I can say the first moment of area of this section is equal to, with respect to x, I can either use this equation if I know where bar, bar is, or I use this equation. If the shape is regular, it's very easy to find this integral. If the shape is not regular, then I can find this integral numerically, something you do in the second semester of this year, numerical analysis. And the same for the x, uh, for the y-axis. If I take an element such as dA, I can say the first moment of area of this uh, tiny element with respect to the y-axis is x dA. If I want for the whole section, I find the integral of this term. Or if I know where x bar is, I can say it's equal to x bar multiplied by a. It means now we've got two equations which we can use to find the center of <coughs> so we can find the center of gravity of any planar shape or shapes. So if I've got a member, it doesn't matter how it, it looks like. If I know the cross-section, I can either use, I can easily use these two equations to find the position of its centroid. If the shape is regular, it's quite straightforward, we can find these two integrals. If not, then we have to solve them numerically. So these two equations are quite useful when we want for the future sections of this chapter. Any questions in regard to slide number three? Yes, please. If you choose a different global the, coordinate system. No, it doesn't make any difference. At the moment, the XY coordinate system is called reference, also called reference coordinate system. But we usually use the reference coordinate system at the base to find the position of the central. It doesn't matter where they are. But G always ends, ends up in the same place if you know what the shape is. Any other questions? So I'm going to use these two equations for you uh, to find the center of gravity of a rectangular section and the center of gravity of a circular section. So this is something you should, you should already know. If you don't, this is not examinable. It's just for your own information. So say we are going to use those two equations to find the center of gravity of a rectangular section. We don't know where the center of gravity of the section is. Somebody is coming from Mars and doesn't know where the center of gravity of the section is. So at the moment, based on what one of the, you said, I am using the reference coordinate system along the two edges of this rectangle. <coughs> So XY coordinate system is there, and this is a typical element which I've chosen on this section with dimensions of dx and dy. So dA is equal to dx dy. Now I'm going to convert this single integral showing with the dA with two integral sign. So I say dA is equal to dx dy, so I write it as a double integral. Now, as you can see, this double integral is quite easy to analyze. It's a it can be separated to two integrals. So we can say, so this function is separable. We can say x dx multiplied by dy. So I divide it to two integrals. So one is integral of dx, and the other one is y dy. So this gives us the integral of a linear function, gives us a quadratic function, it gives us a linear function. So the integral of this 
y is 1 over 2 y squared. The integral of x is equal to, uh, sorry, dx is equal to x. Now, if you look at your coordinate system here, x here for the rectangle changes between 0 and b, and y changes between h and 0. So, look at, please look at the limits of the integral. Now, I substitute the limits in this equation, in that equation. The area is equal to b multiplied by h. So I substitute it, and it gives us x bar, which is equal to b over 2. So the center is located along a line which is equal to b over 2. And I repeat it for the other dimension. And you can find y bar, which is equal to h over 2. It means the center of gravity of a rectangle is located exactly <coughs> at the center. But we know it already. And you can repeat it for a circular section. So please write down on the top of this uh, circle, this is a solid section. We move on to thin wall section in the second hour. I don't want you to confuse you. So this is a solid section. So for a circular section, it's better to use a polar coordinate system. So the two equations are exactly the same. The element, I can say, is equal to dx dy. Or in this polar coordinate system, I can say dx dy is equal to r dr d theta. So this is first very similar to what I did with the other one. That's the area of a circle. So now I separate it to two integrals. And I can easily prove that x bar is equal to 0. And similarly, y bar is equal to 0. As I said, this is not examinable. It's too easy to be asked in exam. So just for your own information. Yes, please. Say it again, please. Oh my God, thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. So this is a pi r squared. So if I just write it, thank you. What I did, I copied and pasted it. So this is pi r squared, which is the area of the circle. And this is also pi r squared. Thank you. So if you have no question, I move on to the next slide. Now say we've got a composite section. So as I said, if the shape is irregular, we have to solve those integrals numerically. Now, if you look at this composite cross-section, you can divide it to, when you say composite section, not in terms of material, in terms of the shape of the section. So in this case, we can say it is a composite section. We can divide it to a series of irregular shapes. So if this is the center of gravity or centroid of this section, and I have x, y attached to the edges of this section as a reference coordinate system, then x bar, y bar, if I know where x bar and y bar are, I can easily find the first moment severity of the section with respect to this reference coordinate system. So I can say, Ix for the whole section is equal to y bar multiplied by a. I can say Iy for the whole section is equal to x bar multiplied by a. This is provided I know where x bar and y bar are. If I don't, I have to solve that, those two equations numerically, but I've divided this to a smaller shapes, smaller regular shapes. Now, based on this superposition rule, 
I can say the first <coughs> moment of area of this section, say with respect to the x-axis, is equal to the summation of the first moments of area of these smaller sections which are making up the section. So I can say Ix of the whole equal to Ix of this smaller rectangle plus Ix of this rectangle plus Ix of this rectangle. The same for Iy. Now what is the Ix of this smaller section with respect to the reference coordinate system X? is equal to its area multiplied by the perpendicular distance of its centroid. So I have divided it to a smaller section with the dimension of A, I mean the cross-sectional area of that little section is A1. The coordinates of its local, I mean center of gravity of that smaller section are X bar one, Y bar one, the same as the other one, and the same as the third one. So I can say Ix1 is equal to A1 multiplied by Y bar 1. For the middle one is X A2 multiplied by Y bar 2. And this is equal to A3 multiplied by Y bar 2. So I just write them in terms of the areas of each <laughs> section and the coordinates of the centroid of each part, the smaller parts. So we end up with two equations, which we usually use them when we can divide the section to a smaller regular shapes. As I said, we can say the first moment of area of this section with respect to an axis is equal to the summation of the first moment of area of the smaller regions which make up the, that section. And you have these two equations in your examination data sheets. Any question in regard to slide number four? Right. Now I'm going to use these two equations for you to find the center of gravity of a thick walled T section. And that is question number Question number 1E. So we've got a thick walled section. Later on today, we analyze the same section when it's a thin walled T section. So our objective is to find the center of gravity of this section and or centroid of this section. How many axes of symmetry this section has? One or two? Okay, so you answered your one question, daily question today, and thank you very much. <laughs> so, I appreciate it. So, so, it has one axis of symmetry. So, we know exactly where G is. So, G is located on the y-axis, which is the axis of symmetry of this section. So, the next stage is to find is y-bar. So here I'm using the reference coordinate system, x-axis, which is along the bottom edge of the T-section, and I am using the y-reference coordinate system, which is the actual axis of symmetry of this section. So automatically x bar is zero because it has one axis of symmetry. So we are after y bar. Now if you look at the slide number four at the bottom, y bar times a, is equal to y bar 1a1 plus y bar 2a2, because in this one, we can divide it to two rectangular ones, uh, smaller regions. The top one is one region, and another one, which is the bottom one, uh, sorry, bottom rectangle. So I divide it to two smaller regions. And I use the equation at the bottom of a slide number <laughs> So this is my reference coordinate system. I have divided it to two rectangles. This is the center of gravity of the top rectangle, and that is the center of gravity of the bottom rectangle. Now, if this is the reference coordinate system, what is the position of this point here? 
if this is the reference coordinate system, what is at the coordinate of this little circle with respect to this axis? Any answer? Is it 80? Is it 40? What is this distance equal to? What is this distance equal to? 40, very good. And how much is this distance, this, this, the coordinate of this point with respect to this reference coordinate system? This is 80, eight, excellent, is 84. So what bar one is equal to, so what bar one is equal to 40, what bar two is equal to 84. A1 is equal to B is equal to 8, and height is equal to 80, so 8 times 80. For bar 2 is 84, A2 is equal to, the width is equal to 80, and the height is equal to 8. So I substitute the values. So this is the total area both of them added together. And now I substitute these values. And it gives me the position of the center of gravity, which is 62 millimeters above the bottom edge of the T-section. But why are we finding the center of gravity? Because if this beam with this T section is subject to bending, it always bends about its neutral axis, which I explain what neutral axis is in future lectures. And the neutral axis always passes through the center, center of gravity of the centroid of this section. I repeat, if you, this T section was subject to bending, it always bends about its neutral axis and the neutral axis passes through the center, centroid of this section. So that's why we need to know where G is to do our bending analysis, stress analysis for bending or deformation of the beam subject to bend. Any question in regard to this slide? So you learned up to now, in regard to first moment of area and to how to find the position of the centroid of the cross section. So if there are no questions, we move on to the next slide. So we move on to slide number five, second moment of area. So first moment of area, little i, <laughs> second moment of area, capital I. So we start with an irregular shape. Say this is a regular shape, the section of a member, and that is the position of its centroid. So the axes passing through the centroid are called central axes, or the local coordinate system of the section. Now it doesn't matter which orientation you draw the central axis, is if it is irregular, it doesn't make any difference. Say we've got an element on this section with the value, with the area of that tiny element is dA, dx multiplied by dy. And say the coordinates of that element are x and y with respect to the central axis of this section. Based on the definition of the second moment of area, the second moment of area of this tiny element with respect to xg is equal to y bar, <coughs> sorry, y squared dA, and with respect to the y g axis is equal to x squared dA. So this is based on the definition of the second moment of area, is equal to y squared dA, the perpendicular distance with respect to that axis, multiplied by dA. Now, if I divide it to so many of these little elements or discretize the region and add them up together, it means I can find the second moment of area of the section with respect to, say, xg. Or mathematically, if, if I want to add them mathematically, another way of doing it 
If I integrate y squared dA over the section, that gives me the second moment of area, which we use capital R to show it with respect to xg. But what does this equation tell us? It tells us the unit of the second moment of area is, a po is the fourth power of length millimeter to the power of four, or meter to the power of four. The other thing, this equation tells us that second moment of area can never be a negative value. A few of you make this mistake in exam and lose some marks for it. So as you can see, it's y squared dA. So it can never be a negative value. It's always a positive value, and its unit is a fourth power of a length. In a similar way, I can say the second moment of area of this section with respect to y-axis is equal to double integral or integral of x squared dA. So these are the definitions for second moment of area of this section with respect to x and y axis. Now I can write the same equations with respect to the global coordinate system, x, y. I can say i, x is equal to y, x, y squared dA. And I can say i, y is equal to x squared dA. Or I can easily mathematically prove that i with respect to x is equal to i with respect to xg plus y by squared multiplied by a. And I can say i with respect to y, which is a global axis, equal to i with respect to this local axis plus a x bar squared, which we call it parallaxis a theory. So as I said, the top two equations, we can write it exactly the same for the bottom one. But in majority textbooks, you can access the values of, you can have the values of second moment of area. Most of the textbooks, most of the design handbooks, they give you with respect to central axis. So if you know what the values are with respect to central axis, you can easily find them with respect to any other axis on the planet on the plane of this section using parallaxis theory. So any question in regard to slide number five? Yes, please. No, because it's, you can, what I'm saying is that I'm going to show you how we can find the second moment of area of a, say, rectangle with respect to its central axis. So these two equations at the moment, you can use them for x and y. I can say ix is equal to y squared dA. So I can do the integration for this coordinate system. But we can also mathematically prove that if I have these values with respect to a central axis, I can find it with respect to any other axis which are parallel to the first one, but are located or offset from the center of gravity. Does it answer the question? Okay. Yes, please. Is it, so this is, um, Textbooks, I mean, this is an engineering topic. I mean, I really like it. I can show you here. It takes about 10, 15 minutes to prove this equation to you. But I would, I would suggest you refer to the recommended textbooks. You can find the proof there. So why we can say ix is equal to ixg a plus a y bar squared. This is a definition for, this is, these two, I mean, that's a good question. These two are the definition of the second moment of area. But the bottom one is we can also write it with respect to the other coordinate system. But because, as I said, in majority of textbooks, they give you the second moment of area with respect to central axis. So if 
you want to find the, with respect to any UL axis, you usually use parallel axis theory. But if what, where these two come from, I can prove it for you. I know the answer. But you can refer to the recommended text. This is an engineering course, not mathematics. So any other questions? Okay. Now let's go back to the um, <laughs> I'll show you how to find the position of the centroid of the rectangle. I would like you to show you how to find the second moments of area, Ix and I will, for a rectangular section. Now, this is again not examinable. It's just for your own information. So again, we start with a small element with the dimensions of dx and dy. Say the coordinates of that element are x and y. So that's the definition of the second moment of area is equal to y squared dA for a small element. And if I integrate it over the section, it gives me for the whole section. Now this is a rectangular section, so we can easily find this integral directly. We don't need to do it numerically. So I can say dA is equal to dx dy. So I write it as a double integral. These two integrals are separable. I can say integral of y squared d, dy multiplied by integral of dx. Now, integral of y squared is 1 over 3 y cubed. And from there, you can find the second moment of area of a rectangle with respect to the x-axis, which is parallel to the bottom edge, is equal to 1 over 12 b, which is the width, multiplied by h height cubed. In a similar way, based on the definition of the second moment of area, x squared dA, so if I say, again, I separate it to two integrals, and I can say the second moment of area with respect to the y-axis is equal to 1 over 12 b cubed h. So these are, you're going to use them a lot, and you don't need to memorize it, but by, you will learn them by heart by the end of this semester. And you've got them in your um, examination data sheets and also, at, I think, on a table within this uh, chapter. Are there any questions? And similarly, I can, you can find the second moments of area of the Secular section, please write them on top of slide 7. This is a solid section. It's equal to pi d4 over 64 and pi d4 over 64 for both. For both of them are pi d4 over 64. Again, by the end of this semester, you will learn this by heart. You don't memorize it, but because you're going to use them a lot, you learn them anyway by heart. So this is a slide number 8. So you can see on the slide number eight, which is a table, please write down on top of this slide, I have written solid. It, they are all solid. They are not thin walled sections. So starting with a rectangle, we know where the position of the centroid is, the area, the second moment of area with respect to the x-axis, the second moment of area with the y-axis. And this concept, you're going to learn it in the next slide, slide number nine polar second moment of area, which is summation of these two. So if I add these two, it gives me the polar second moment of area with respect to the z-axis, which you usually use it for torsion, which is normal to this uh, plane of the section. So it's the summation of these two. For a, rect for a circular section, this is the position of a centroid area, second moment of area, both of them are the same. And J is summation of these two. We don't do any analysis on rectangular, uh, sorry, triangular section or elliptical or semicircular solid section. We will do a lot of analysis on the same sections when they are thin walled. So this is just for solid sections. Now we move on to a slide number nine, just give you a 
definition of polar second moment severe, and the second hour we mostly focus on thin wood sections. So this is a section, is irregular. That is its center of gravity, central axis, global axis. The coordinates of the centroid with respect to the global axis are x bar and y bar. And I've selected one element on the section. And this is the definition of the second moment of area of the section with respect to its central axis. Now we have another moment of area, which is called polar second moment of area. Say so R is the distance of this element with respect to G. Do you agree that R squared is equal to X squared plus Y squared? So therefore, I can say, by definition, actually, by definition, the polar second moment of area of this element with respect to G is equal to R squared dA. It's the definition of the polar second moment of area. We say it is G, but it's actually with respect to the Z axis, which you don't see, and it's normal to the plane of the section. So Ix is respect to Xg, Iy with respect to Yg, but you don't see Z. But we say usually J, polar second moment of area with respect to G, but it's actually with respect to the Z axis because its torsion is applied above the Z axis. So that is the definition of the polar second moment of area of this element with respect to G. We say R squared dA. So this is J with respect to G or J with respect to Z. I can say R squared is equal to X squared plus Y squared. So I can say J is equal to the summation of these two if I separate these two terms. So that is how I showed you on the previous slide on the mate. And similarly, I can say J with respect to a normal axis to the plane at passing through point O or J with respect to O is equal to I with respect to X plus I with respect to Y. So if a component is subject to bending about XG axis, then we use IXG. If a component, this member, is subject to bending about YG axis, we use IYG, it comes in the future slides. If this section is about a torsion about the Z axis, which is normal to the plane, then we use JG or JO because they characterize the stiffness of the structure when they are subject to bending or torsion. So any questions in, reg in regard to slide number nine? Yes, please. What well, are the functions for IXO and IYO, IXG and IYG are shown in this above? IXG and... I X O because of J O. No, 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 no. I wrote it for you, G. Usually in textbooks, they don't write G for you. I've written it because I want to say that these two are for central axis passing through G. So in textbooks, they don't write G for you. I've written it myself. It's some they do. The majority, they don't. But they usually, when you say I X and I Y, they assume X and Y pass through the center of gravity of the section. No, don't add IX or IYO. You can do if you want to for yours, for your own case. Any other questions? Okay, so I give you 10 minutes, please. And please get back here at 11, please. <laughs>
Right, shall we carry on? So in the first hour, I showed you um, how to find uh, the center of gravity of a section, the first moment of area, and the sec second moment of area, and also polar second moment of area, which section with respect to any axis passing through, I mean, located on the plane of the section. So earlier I showed you the second moment of area of a rectangle with respect to central axis are uh, equal to 1 over 12 bh cubed, i with respect to x is equal to 1 over 12 bh cubed, and with respect to y is equal to 1 over 12 b cubed h. Now please could you draw something big around the slide number 10 as you're going to use it a lot. And whatever we, I'm covering on a slide 10, obviously, is applicable to thin walled sections as well. Now, say we've got the second moment of area of this rectangle with respect to global axis x and y. So, based on the parallax theory, I can say I with respect to x is equal to 1 over 12 bh cubed plus the area of the rectangle, which is bh, multiplied by this perpendicular distance of g, which is a multiplied by s squared. So i with respect to x is equal to 1 over 12 bh cubed with respect to its central axis plus the area bh multiply by this perpendicular distance squared. So A, S squared. I with respect to Y, which is a global axis, equal to 1 over 12 B cubed H plus A, BH, multiply by this perpendicular distance of G with respect to the Y axis, which is T, T 
t squared. Any problem with the slide number 10? It's quite straightforward. No difficulty with that. But we're going to apply it a lot today. So we move on to the same T section, solid, uh, thick wool T section we analyzed earlier. We found the position of the centroid, which was 62 millimeters above the bottom edge of the T section. Now the problem now is asking us to find the second moment severity of the section with respect to its central axis. So the blue ones are its central axis. The bottom edge was just a reference coordinate system. The vertical one is the same. The collinear, they're the same. So based on the superposition rule, I can say Ix is equal to Ix of the top one, of the top rectangle, plus Ix of the bottom one. So I've divided it to two sections. So I can say Ix for the whole section is equal to Ix of this section this part of the section with respect to x plus ix of this part of the section with respect to this x blue line. <coughs> and the same i, y. So I start, obviously, I need parallaxis theory because the blue line here at the moment is offset from the center of gravity of the top section and offset from the center of gravity of the bottom section. When I say section, I mean these smaller rectangles. So this blue line, as you can see, is offset from these two points. So that's why we need a parallaxis theory. So for the top one, with respect to its own axis, so if I draw for you a line here, so we have this top section, it's got its own a local axis. So I say this is its local axis, axis, and this bottom one also has its own local axis. So I start with the bottom one. With respect to its own axis, this rectangle, with respect to this axis, coming from design handbook I showed you earlier, is equal to 1 over 12, the width multiplied by its height cubed. But this axis is offset from this one. So I need this parallaxis theory. So I say this must be plus the area multiplied by this perpendicular distance squared. And the top one as well. With respect to its own axis is equal to 1 over 12, b which is 80, multiplied by 8 cubed, which I've written it here. And then I need parallaxis theory because this line is offset from this line for this amount. How much is for the third top one? So it's 1 over 12 bh cubed plus a, multiply by this distance squared, which is 62 minus 40 squared, multiply by its area. And for the top one, we've got area eight, 80 times 8, multiply by this perpendicular distance. This is 62, this is 84, so it is 84 minus 62 squared. Is there anyone, I mean, do you need me to explain it again? Go through it again. So I divide the T section to two smaller rect rectangles, top one and the bottom one. For the bottom one, it's got its own local axis based on the figure I showed you, the slide uh, number 10, I believe. So this is a rectangle on its own. It's, independent, it's an independent rectangle, and it's got its own local axis. So with respect to its own local axis, its second moment of area is equal to 1 over 12 bh cubed. So it's 
So this rectangle has a width of 8, height of 80. So it's 1 over 12, 8 multiply 80 cubed. But because this point is offset from this axis which we are after, therefore I need to find this perpendicular distance. The area is obvious, 8 multiplied by 80, multiplied by the square of this perpendicular distance. This is 62, this point is 40, this height is 40, so it's 62 minus 40 squared. The same for the top one. 1 over 12, B, H cubed, plus its area, multiplied by this perpendicular distance squared. And the answer is 9.642 times 10 to the power of 4, fourth power of millimeters. Now for the IY, as you can see, it has, the section has one axis of symmetry. And if I look at this rectangle, its y-axis is the same as the globe, this y-axis that we are after. And if I look at the top rectangle, its y-axis again is the same as the y-axis I am after. So for the IY, I don't need any power axis theory because x bar for both of them are zero. So for IY, if I divide it to two parts, for both of them this is zero because the y-axis of the bottom rectangle, the y-axis of the top rectangle, and y-axis of what we are after, they're all collinear. So x bar for all of them are zero. <coughs> Sorry. So we don't need any power axis theory for IY. And what is IY equal to? IY is equal to 1 over 12 B cubed H. So we have 1 over 12, 8 to the power of 3 multiplied by 80, plus 1 over 12, 80 to the power of 3 multiplied by 8. And this is the answer. So because the section had no one axis of symmetry, this is why we don't need any power axis theory for IY. We need it for X, X1. Any question on this in regard to this slide? Okay. have a hollow section, for example, this is a solid section. We have, I get the second moment of area of this solid circular section from design hand, pi d4 over 64. Or for a rectangle. So it's quite straightforward, 1 over 12 bhq, 1 over 12 bqh. Now, say we've got a tube, similar to what you're going to do your experiment on. So it's an outer diameter of DO, inner diameter of DI, and the mean diameter is for the circle which is between these two. So at the moment, we've got outer diameter DO, inner diameter DI. So if I remove material from the structure, it loses its strength, its stiffness. And because I characterizes the the stiffness of the structure when it's subject to bending, when you remove it, forget about mathematics, when you remove it, it loses its, some of its strength, the stiffness. Or mathematically, I can say, I of this section of this tube, say with respect to x1 axis, x axis, is the second moment of area of the solid section minus the second moment of area of the region which I've removed the material from. So mathematically, we say this is how it works. You've taken some area from the section. From engineering point of view, when you remove it, you, the material loses some stiffness or strength. So that's why we end up with this negative sign. 
And the same for ducts. So for example, we have a duct or a rectangular tube. Again, I can say the second moment of area of the section is the second moment area of the solid section minus the second moment of area of this hollow section. So this equation again is valid. So you can see here we end up with a negative sign here. So this is the second moment of area solid one, the second moment of area of the hollow part which are subtracted from each other, and the same for the right hand side. For a circle, they are both the same. For a rectangle, a rectangular section, a duct, or a, we call it a, a tube rectangular section, or duct, it is how we write. <coughs> Any problem with a slide number 11? I'm sure it's not difficult to understand. And if you want to J, as I said, pull a second moment of area, we can easily prove is equal to the summation of Ix and Iy. Now, we move on to the difficult, a bit difficult more. It's not difficult, it's a slightly different with what you've done so far. So definitely, you get in your, in your exam one or two questions in which you need to find the second moment of area of a thin walled section. Either it has straight edges or it has curved edges. Definitely you have one question or what two questions. So when we say a thin section is when the thickness in comparison with the other dimensions of the section is small. So that is a, the definition of a thin walled section. The thickness in comparison with the other dimensions of the cross section is small, not with respect to length. Other dimension of the cross section is a small. So when T is small, in that case, we can show a th thin walled section using uh, the mid lines of its edges or mid lines of its walls. So if you look at the textbooks, when you're drawing a thin walled section, they don't show it the way I've drawn it for you here. This is how we show a thick walled section. For a thin walled section, we just use the mid shell or mid plane of the section. It looks as if you assume it's like a flat panel which is folded at different locations. Oh, I hope nobody comes after me. So it's like a flat panel. You're folding it at different locations. This is how we treat a thin walled section. We cannot do the same for a thick walled section. For a thin walled section, you assume it's a flat panel which is folded at different locations. When it comes to analysis, because T is very small, we ignore the higher power of T in our calculations. So whenever you see T squared, T cubed, you just ignore it. And the reason is say T is equal to one millimeter, or one times 10 to the power of minus a three. If it is cubed, it's one times 10 to the power of minus nine, which is a very, very small value. So in our calculations, we ignore higher power of a t. So square and higher power of t are usually ignored. And the overlap of the material is also ignored. As I said, we assume it's a flat sheet which is folded at different locations. So when you're doing the analysis for a thick section, you cannot ignore the overlap of the material. So you have to divide it to two or three in this case, three tri uh, rectangles and analyze it. In this case, if I draw it as a line, I just ignore the overlap of the material, which I cannot do it here. So based on these assumptions, on the slide number 12, we find the second moment of area of a thin wood section. Now, if we move on to a slide in number 13. So slide number 13, you've got the solutions, actually, for questions, um, for questions 1A, 1B, and 1C. You already got them. Now, I have expanded the slide number 13 to two slides. So it's exactly the same as what you see, but in order to show you, 
I have divided it to two slides. So I start with a flat panel. Say this a flat panel is subject to bending. This flat panel can be considered as a rectangle. I mean, imagine it's a rectangle with the height of T and the width of A. For this rectangle, we know where the position of its centroid is. So G is obvious. If G, X and Y are passing through the center of gravity of this flat panel, so we know X bar and Y bar, both of them are zero, assuming X, Y are passing through it. Now we are after I, X, and I, Y. If it is a rectangle, based on the slide number 10, the width is equal to A, the height is equal to T. So therefore, I, X is equal to 1 over 12, A, T cubed. And based on what I showed you earlier, in calculations of second moment of area of thin wall section, we ignore the higher power of t. It means Ix is equal to zero, almost equal to zero. It means this, if I apply a moment for this section about x-axis, it has no stiffness. So it is almost equal to zero. Obviously, it's not zero, but it's almost equal to zero. Now, I go for IY now. Based on the slide number 10 and also the definition of the second moment of area, IY is equal to 1 over 12 T A cubed T. We cannot ignore it because we don't have high power of T. So this flat panel is a stronger about a moment applied about the y-axis, which is equal to 1 over 12 a cubed t, hardly has any stiffness if it's about a moment applied about the x-axis. <coughs> so this is for a horizontal panel. Now I'm going to rotate it for 90 degrees. So now we are working on this panel. Say it's quite long and you're looking at just its cross-section. Again, x and y axis are passing through the center of gravity of the section at the moment. It's their, its central axis. So Ix is equal to 1 over 12 bh cubed. b is equal to t. Height is equal to a, so it's equal to 1 over 12 t a, a cubed. And the other one is almost equal to 0. Any questions in regard to these two figures on your slide number 13? Yes, please. Uh, do we have to make the assumption that we are uh, assuming T is a very thin section to be zero and everything? That is a very good question. Yeah. I tell you something. The majority of questions in your exam are based on thin wall sections. So when I say thin, it means thin, so we should ignore high power of T. Let's answer the question. And if you uh, read uh, the examples in the aircraft structures by Metzen, it mentions that all the descriptions, the section is thin walled, reinforced thin walled. So automatically, yes, you have to. So, any questions in regard to these two simple examples? <coughs> so, we move on to the next example on the same slide. It's a channel section. It's like a flat panel, we have folded it at these two locations, here and there. Now I'm going to find the position of his centroid, center of gravity, and the second moment of area with respect to x and y axis. And look at this diagram, x and y axis are not the, both of them the central axis of this section, only one of them is. However, that is the requirement of the question. How many axes of symmetry this section has? This is your second daily one for the second hour. What is the? 
There is a single one symmetry. Okay. Okay, that's very good. So it has one axis of symmetry. So if it has one axis of symmetry, it is the x-axis. It means the centroid is located on the x-axis. So I haven't found G first, so I go for the second moment of variance first. Now I x here at the moment, I have divided the section to three parts two flat panels and a vertical wall. So this is divided to three sections, two flat panels and a vertical wall. And the green dots are the center of gravity of each of those little areas. Here I can say Ix of the whole section is equal to Ix of the two flat panels plus Ix of the vertical panel or the vertical wall. Now Ix for the one of the flat panels is equal to, this is for the vertical one, sorry. So for the vertical one, the width is equal to T, the height is equal to 2A. So we have one over 12, B which is equal to T, multiplied by height to the power of three. So is for the vertical panel. My question from you is that, do we need a parallel axis a theory for the vertical panel? I have drawn for you the local axis for each of these. So this is the X of this vertical panel, which is collinear with this X. Do we need paraxis theory? No, very good. So this is for the vertical one. Now we move on to the horizontal panels. So first we start with its own local axis. With respect to its own local axis, is equal to one over 12, B which is A, height which is T. So it's one over 12, A T cubed. But because this is offset from x-axis for the value of a, so I say the area is a multiplied by t, this is the area, I write it down for you. So this is the area of the panel. And what was the equation for the power axis theory? Y bar is squared. So this is a, the perpendicular distance is A, which is this distance. Squared. And the top panel has exactly the same Ix as the bottom panel, because it is equal to 1 over 12, 80 cubed. We know this Y is negative, but because it is a squared, it doesn't make any difference. So I've multiplied it here by 2. question with respect to Ix for the two horizontal panels and the vertical panel. Okay. Now Iy. Iy is equal to, let's start with again with the vertical panel. Its width is equal to t. Its height is equal to 2a, two, two so it's 1 over 12 t cubed 2a. And for the top and bottom panels, I y is equal to 1 over 12 a cubed t, and then using the power axis theory, you have to square this distance. So it is a multiplied by x bar squared. So this is 1 over 12 plus a multiply x bar. What is x bar? Is this distance. Which is a over g. Now 
So again here, T cubed can be ignored. So here we end up with 0, 6, 7, A cubed T. So you can see this channel section has got more stiffness if it's subject to a bending about the x-axis rather than the y-axis. You can see this is almost three times the other value. So it is a strongest, uh, sorry, stiffer if it's subject to, again, a stronger as well, if it's subject to a bending moment about the x-axis. Now say we want to find it's the position of its centroid, the center of gravity. I've divided it into three sections. So based on this slide number four, I can say my bar is zero, obviously, and we use if divided to three, like the composite section, slide number four divided into three sections. The area is the total area. As I said, we ignore the overlap of the material. So we say 80, 80 multiplied by two plus 280, it gives us 480. So we've got 280, 80, 80. Now here we've got, we need to find out uh, the position of or the coordinates of these uh, three green dots. So we've got zero because this is located on the axis, x-axis. We've got A over two, which is this distance, and A over two, which is this distance. And it gives us X bar, which is A over four. I think you don't have it on the slide number 13. I've added it as well for you. Because in question number one, I've given you a series of geometries at the end of the um, Description of the question, I've created for you a table with all the answers in that table. I, uh, this uh, is not, this answer or solution is not in your slide number 13, I've added it for you. Any question in regard to this solution? Now say if I was asked to find uh, the second moment of area of the whole section Say with respect to this axis, so its central axis. This is what I've found with respect to this axis. So I've already got this, which is coming from here. And then plus A, area of the whole section, multiplied by X bar squared. So this is something extra I've given you here at the bottom. I repeat, at the moment, I found the second moment of area with respect to the Y axis. Say if I was told to find it with respect to this axis. In that case, I've already got this. The total area is 480. I multiplied by x bar squared, which I found it just now, a over 4 squared. You can easily use this equation to find it with respect to this axis. Any question? So please help me to do the same for this T section. We solved it first as a thick walled section. Now we are going to analyze it as a thin walled T section. The thickness is uniform around it. And our objective is to find the position of its centroid. That is a question number 1F. So our objective is to find the position of its centroid and the second moment of area with respect to this, its central axis, x and y. So if it is composite section, how many smaller sections I can divide this to? How many? Yes, please? Three could do it with three, but I would suggest to two, two is easier. Shall we go for a flat panel on the top and a vertical panel as well? So we divide it to two sections. 
Now, var bar is equal to, from the equation coming from a slide, a number four. So can you tell me, can you think about it? What is the total area of this T-section? Just think about it. Don't say it out loud. As I said, we ignore the overlap of the material. The thickness is uniform. The top section, the length of the top section is 2A, and the vertical one is also 2A. So what is the answer for A? Yes, please? Thank you. So total A is 480. Excellent. Now, assuming we have the reference coordinate system, one X at the bottom of this T section and Y passing through the middle of the vertical wall. So what is a Y bar equal to? Y bar 1 equal to? If this is 1, what is Y bar 1 equal to? Very good, A. And what is Y bar 2 equal to? No. Y bar 2? Two? 2A. Two Very good. So Y bar 1 is equal to A because if I draw the, I don't know if I've drawn it for you for, oh yes I have. So Y bar 1 is equal to A. Y bar 2 is equal to 2A. So these green dots are the center of gravity of each of these smaller sections. So i written for you area one, area two, void bar one, void bar two. So from there, we can find the position of its centroid. X bar is zero. Now move on to Ix. For a rectangle, with respect to the horizontal axis, it's 1 over 12 bh cubed. With b is the width, h is the height. So starting from this rectangle, with respect to its own x-axis, 1 over 12 b is equal to? b is equal to? t, well done. And h is equal to? 2a, well done. So 1 over 12, T, 2A cubed, do we need Paragraphs' theory or not? It is offset from this. We need Paragraphs' theory. So this is with respect to its own local axis, which is this green arrow, plus the area, which is 280, plus multiply by the perpendicular distance <coughs> squared. This is Y bar squared, this distance. So this is one and a half A, this is A, and it doesn't matter which order you put it in because it is a squared in exam. Don't bother which one is positive or negative, it doesn't matter, it is a squared. Is everyone happy with what I've written here? Very good. Now, could you write down what I'm supposed to write here, please, for the top one? Just give it, just give it a go, please. Write it for the top one, please. First, you set it to its own axis, then you need to use the paraxis theory. So we're writing it for the top one. 1 over 12, how much is B? 2A. And how much is the height? T, very good. So 1 over 12, B h cubed, plus this area, which is 280, multiplied by the square of this distance. This is equal to y bar, which is 1 and a half a. This is equal to 2a, so 2a minus 1 and a half a squared. It doesn't matter which order because it is a squared. Is there anything we should remove? Ignore, yes, so we ignore a T cubed, and the answer is 1.67 A cubed T. Now for IY, the bottom panel, the top panel, and the whole section have the same Y axis, because Y is the axis of symmetry. So we don't need any parallel axis theory. So therefore, we just say 1 over 12, V cubed, H, 
for the bottom one, one over 12 BQ page for the top one. This is almost zero, and it gives us 0, 06, 7, 8 cubed T. Yes, please. Why? Uh, why why bar is not two a plus t over oh. no because we are looking at this distance perpendicular distance between these two so what is this distance I mean, uh, why two bar at the very beginning it doesn't matter the order I mean, this is A1 is equal to 280, 280 multiplied by this distance, which is A, plus 280 multiplied by 2A. Are you happy with this answer? No, could you, could you answer? Are you happy with this answer? You're not happy with this answer? Okay. So are you happy with this equation? Okay. A1, Y1. Okay. So this is A1. Are you happy that A1 is equal to 280? Yes. Okay. What is the position of this point with respect to this reference coordinate system? So it is 280 multiplied by A. Okay. Now what is the area of the top one? Are you happy 280? Okay. Could you tell me, if this is a reference coordinate system, what is the coordinate of this green dot with respect to this point here? 2a plus 3 over 2. Now, that's a, what I'm saying is that we ignore the overlap of the material. So we do not write 2a plus d. We are assuming it's like a line. We don't ignore. No, we just, uh, no, absolutely right. But we also ignore the overlap of the material. Does it answer the question? Yeah. Okay. So only, are, are we happy with this answer? Okay, so we move on to a bit harder. The, the remaining slides are slightly harder, so just listen carefully. So we start with a semicircular section. For the semicircular section, we assume the thickness is uniform. Our objective is to find the position of a centroid and the second moment of area passing through axis, not the central axis, axis passing through the center of the circle. So if you look at the design handbook, the handbooks or textbooks, they don't give you the second moment of area of a semicircular section on an arc with respect to its central axis. They give you with respect to axes passing through the center of the circle. You will find out when you do your coursework, the second coursework, and also the future examples of uh, this section. So the first objective is finding the position of the centroid of this, and the, with respect to axes passing through the center of the circle. The thickness is uniform. Now this equation is still valid. X bar is equal to integral of X dA divided by A. But because this section is a thin, we can make some approximation. Now here I can say the area A is equal to, assuming this is like a strip or a ribbon, which is flat, with the thickness of T or height of T, I can say area of this semicircular region is equal to pi r, which is this length, half the perimeter of a circle, multiplied by t. So I can say a is equal to pi r t. For, I can say it if it's thin. I cannot say it if it's thick. Now we move on to the top one. The top one, based on what we did earlier, I divide dA, I change dA, or integral of x dA, to in, double integral of x dx dy. Now the section is thin, we can make some approximation. First of all, we can use a curvy linear coordinate system. What is a curvy linear coordinate system? K 
Kevin-Linie Cohesion System is one dimensional, but in a Kevin-Linie manner. It means if I say the origin of this Kevin-Linie Cohesion System is S, the coordinate of each point on this system is the length of the curve or the line adjoining that point to the origin on the curve path, actually. So in X coordinate system, you're familiar with. So you say, this is the origin. If I want a coordinate of this point, it's the distance from the origin on this straight line. So that is again one dimensional, but look at this one. It is undimensional, but it's in a curvilinear manner. So the location of or coordinate of this point in this curvilinear coordinate system is the distance from the origin or the length of the arc from the origin I mean, or the length of the arc joining this point to the origin. So again, it is a still one-dimensional. Now say on this curvilinear coordinate system, I have the DA. I want to find the DA value for this actually semicircular section. I can say for this small element on this semicircular thin bold section, I can say DA is equal to, if this T is T times DS. So what is DS? is similar to dx we have here. We have ds here. So I can say dA is equal to t, the thickness, multiplied by ds. Now x and y are the coordinates of this element, similar to what we did for the rectangular section. So dA is equal to t, t ds. Now the problem here is that I have changed dA to TDS. So I've got rid of one of the dimensions. So I have a curvilinear coordinate system and I have a Cartesian coordinate here. So we have two different coordinates now, X and DS. So because the shape is a semicircular or circular, what I can do, I can convert both a curvilinear coordinate system and Cartesian coordinate system to polar coordinates. So I repeat, this is how I started it. That is the equation I have. So this is what we did for a rectangular section. We, for dA, we chose a small element. That is exactly what I've done here. For a solid section, we say dA is equal to dx dy. This is a thin section. I can say dA is equal to tds. Now I have inclu included a new coordinate system, which is a curvilinear coordinate system. I also have a Cartesian coordinate here. So the best way is to convert both of them to a polar coordinate system, or polar coordinates. So in this case, I say if the origin of my polar coordinate system is y, and theta is measured from y in anticlockwise direction, I can say x is equal to r sine of theta and y is equal to r cosine of theta. So in that case, I can say ds is equal to r d theta. It's a small change in angle anticlockwise from theta, uh, sorry, from the y-axis. x is equal to r sine of theta and y is equal to r cosine of theta. So because it was thin, I used curvilinear coordinate system, but it's because still I had a Cartesian one, I converted both of them to polar. Now I'm going to insert it in the top equation. And look at the limits of the integral. It's changing from zero. So this is the zero value for theta and changes to 90 degrees and 280 degrees. Now, integral of sine of theta is cosine of theta, minus cosine of theta, and then we have these two limits. From there, you can find the position of the centroid of this semicircular section. Any question in regard to this slide? Yes, please. <coughs> Who 
could you uh, say that a bit louder, please? Okay, why am I multiplying by t? Yeah. Which one? Is this one or this one? Uh, the final uh, r sine t dot t r. So d a is equal to t d s. d s is equal to r d theta. So therefore d a is equal to t r d theta. So what you see here is d a. So I write it down for you here. This is equal to dA, which is this dA here. And this is equal to x. And the content of this slide is that you might get an exam. You might, I might ask you to find the position of the centroid of a semicircular section. You have the answer in your examination data sheets. But you need to know how to get from here to there. But does it answer your question? Um, no, because um, I, I don't get why it's like, uh, the, uh, yeah, the S, like T is getting multiplied. It shouldn't get added to R. Okay. Now, can you see this element here? This element here. This element is like this. The, the thickness of this element is T, and the length is DS. What is ds equal to? ds equal to this central angle, which is d theta, multiplied by r. So we have ti d theta, which is da, x, which is equal to this distance, which is r sine of theta. Does it answer the question? OK, good. Any other questions on the slide number 14? Yes, please. Okay, so that is a very good question. Now we've got, this is, the integral of sine of theta is a minus a cosine of theta. Okay, I think it's better to. So the integral is a minus cosine of theta. And what are the limits of the theta is pi and zero. What is cosine of pi equal to? Uh, minus one. Well done. And what is cosine of zero equal to? One. Okay, what's the difference between two? Two. Okay, so you end up with two here. Does it answer the question? Yes. Okay. So the answer to this question is cosine of theta, the integral of sine of theta is cosine of theta multiplied by minus one. The upper limit is pi, so minus cosine of theta gives us one, and then one plus one becomes two, so you are, end up with two here. Any other questions? Very good questions. So let's move on to a slide number 15, please. The second moment of area, again, this could be an exam question. I might ask you to prove it in exam. How to find the second moment of area of a semicircular section with respect to x and y axis passing through its, the center of the circle? We already found x bar. So ix, that is the definition of second moment of area. Now because this is a thin section, we can make some approximation. This is the curvilinear coordinate system. We usually put the origin at the open end. In this case, if it's a closed-ended thin wall section, you can put it anywhere. For an open section, it's better to put it at the origin of the section. Well, it doesn't make any difference. You can you get the same answer. Well, this is the fashion, I mean, this is popular, I mean, common to do it. So we have, again, a small element. The length of the element in the co curvilinear coordinate system is ds. The area of the element is equal to t ds. So da is equal to t multiplied by ds. ds has the central angle of d theta. 
Therefore, dA is equal to T times R times D theta. Now, can somebody tell me what Y is equal to in this polar coordinate system? Is Y equal to R sine of theta or R cosine of theta? If theta is measured from the Y axis in the anti-clockwise direction, what is Y equal to? Is it very good. So R is equal to cosine of theta. So could you, could you please write it down? Because in future examples and the course work, second course work you do, the origin at the moment for this section is along the y-axis, theta equal to zero for the section is at this position here. So this is theta equal to zero. Can somebody tell me what theta equal to for this point? 90 degrees. And what is theta equal to for this point here? Because usually you assume for your polar coordinate system, you've done so far, you, x was your origin. So you measure theta anticlockwise from the x-axis. In this case, it's from y-axis anticlockwise. So y is equal to r cosine of theta. So y squared is r squared cosine of theta squared. dA is equal to trd theta times. Now I have converted both a Cartesian coordinate system and a curvilinear coordinate system S to polar coordinates. So I converted a double integral to a single integral. This is a double integral for a solid section or a thick walled section. For thin section, we converted it because of it being thin to a single integral. How many variables do we have in this integral? One or two? One. And theta is changing between zero and pi. What is cosine squared theta equal to? Is one plus cosine of two theta divided by two. Now what is the integral of one? The integral of one is equal to theta. Integral of cosine of two theta is equal to one over two sine of two theta. Now if we have these two limits, then we find the answer. So for your information, I added, because some of the students, so the integral of one is theta. The integral of cosine of two theta is one over two sine of two theta. So the integral of one plus cosine of two theta is theta plus one over two sine of two theta. Is everyone happy about this? And then you have these two limits. You can find the answers. <laughs>